Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today again. Uh, today, the auto quality is a little bit different. I am in the islands currently, but I absolutely had to do this interview with fan favorite guest of the show. Uh, requested to be back on so many times. We have Dr. Sanjeev Chopra himself. How's it going, Sanjeev? Oh, it's going great. Thank you so much for asking. I bet it is going well, man. The brand new book available on Amazon right now. I mean, this is right up our alley. Coffee, the magical elixir is the title of the book. Facts that will astound and perk you up. Again, available on Amazon now, uh, paperback soon. Talk to us about the book, Sanjeev. Uh, What inspired you to go this deep and um, some of the most surprising facts in there? Yeah. So, you know, uh, I think it was five years ago, I wrote a book called Uh, five things you can do to live a happier, healthier, longer life. The Big Five. I loved it. It was called The Big Five. Yeah. And the first chapter was on coffee. And if I recollect correctly, it had 41 or 42 pages. And then we talked, I talked about exercise and vitamin D and nuts and meditation. Then I put a little bit about aspirin. I think about sleep. Since that time, in five years, the research on coffee keeps coming and coming and coming. Right. And if you go to your primary care physician and say, I heard this guy and he said, you know, coffee is amazing. It's a superfood. It's a magical elixir, has unbelievable health benefits. He or she is likely to say these studies come and go and everything in moderation is good. But in reality, the studies on coffee and the health benefits keep coming. They're not going. And uh, it turns out that the more you drink, the better off you are. Now, of course, one can drink too much and it can lead to heartburn, diarrhea, tremor, insomnia. So what I recommend is drink two to four cups of coffee a day. Since that book came out, studies came out showing that people who drink coffee, men and women, have lower mortality. So that would be the holy grail, right? If it lowers the risk of cirrhosis, diabetes, seven common cancers, Parkinsonism, Alzheimer's, on and on, then, hey, these people should be living longer. And the answer is yes. So the first study came out in the New England Journal of Medicine. And now there are studies in the Annals of Internal Medicine. A couple of years ago, in the same issue of the Annals of Internal Medicine, two articles and an editorial. And it also shed some interesting light because I often be asked the question, how should I drink my coffee? Is it okay to put milk, cream, sugar? And my answer would be, you know, I don't know of a study addressing it. I drink it black. I think it's okay for you to put milk or sugar. My one refrain is, do not put artificial sweeteners. Ah, right. Right? Diet drinks are linked to a three times increase in stroke and heart attacks. Get rid of that diet Coke, diet ginger ale. The best drink in the world is water and then coffee. And if once in a while you want to have a can of Coke, get it. I do that every now and then. It's so refreshing. And I'll drink one third of it and I'll dump the rest. <laughs> right. Or I'm maybe you get, the, you get the sugar cane version from Mexico. Yeah. It's even better yeah. than the stuff we and have you here. Know, it turns out diet drinks change the gut microbiome. We have 100 trillion bacteria in our gut. In aggregate, they weigh three pounds. It's been called the second human genome, the inner bacterial forest. It has implications on obesity, diabetes, cancer, response to chemotherapy, side effects of chemotherapy, autism, Parkinson's disease, dementia, unbelievable. One of the hottest topics in medicine. And when you take a diet drink, it changes your gut microbiome and makes your blood sugar go up higher. Mm -hmm. So drink your coffee the way you want it. Then this article in in the Annals of Internal Medicine was from 10 European countries. They looked at more than half a million subjects. They all drink their coffee differently. They make it different. It didn't make a difference. They all had lower total 
mortality. And in the same issue of the Annals of Internal Medicine, a study from Hawaii, and uh, this looked at different, different ethnic groups. It didn't matter if you're white Caucasian, Asian American, Hispanic, Latino, African American, everyone, men and women, had low total and cause specific mortality. So that is absolutely fascinating. And then because I talk about it, because I write about it, my brilliant colleagues from around the country will often call me or send me an email. Sanjay, you've probably already seen this study, but in case you missed it. <laughs> so a few months ago, uh, a dear colleague, Dr. Lowell Schnipper, he's a tenured professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, brilliant. He's an oncologist, was chief of hematology oncology at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where I work, major teaching affiliate of Harvard Medical School. And the article he sent me was published in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, Oncology. And it said that patients with advanced metastatic colon cancer, so they have colon cancer, it's spread outside the confines of the colon, maybe gone to the liver, lymph nodes, bone, lungs, who drink coffee, have improved disease-free survival. Wow. wow. And it was seen with both regular and decaf. So very important to remember that it's not the caffeine. Coffee has a thousand constituents and uh, they are amazingly protective and good for health. It has the richest antioxidant called chlorogenic acid. It's insulin sensitizing. So it protects against type two diabetes. So here was the study, people who drink coffee, those with metastatic advanced colon cancer have improved disease-free survival, seen with both regular and decaf coffee, and seen in a dose-dependent fashion. Jeez. That means if you drink three, you're better off than two, four better than three, two better than one. And every time you see a study in which there's a dose-dependent effect, it adds credibility. It says, okay, there's a mechanistic explanation. And if you drink more, you're getting more benefit. Wow. Right? So, so pretty astounding. I, I, I know people who are tuned into the coffee world might see it as a preventative, but to see the study on advanced cancer increases. Isn't that fiber, amazing? That is a yeah. total game changer and changes the way I think about it. Yeah. And when people ask me, what do you think is the mechanism? I say, you know, honestly, I don't know. Right. But coffee... Uh, people who drink coffee have low levels of CRP, C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation. They have low levels of something called TNF-alpha. Even TNF-alpha, if you spell it out, sounds bad. Tumor <laughs> necrosis factor. Hello. <laughs> so they have low levels. <clears throat> and my belief is that they have less inflammation. right? And we're now learning that inflammation is not only bad in infectious diseases, trauma, so, you know, even with COVID-19, but also in heart disease and in cancer, in obesity. Inflammation is the enemy. Mm -hmm. And if we can curb inflammation, then maybe nature takes over and our immune system says, yeah, Colon cancer, metastatic, I can deal with it. <laughs> wow. No <laughs> doubt. I, I, I'm sure there is a link there. There's a few things that I'd love to, to dig into there. Um, first of all, you mentioned the microbiome. Are you, aware of yeah. any are you aware of any studies on the effect of coffee on the microbiome in your gut? Yes, absolutely. There, there's a, a study that I'm aware of that looked at coffee drinkers and it showed that their gut microbiome, so that's 100 trillion bacteria in our gut. And they're good bacteria, they are bad bacteria. Good bacteria are anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Bad bacteria are pro-inflammatory. And the people who drink coffee have more of the good bacteria and less of the bad bacteria. Wow. Tea, I looked at it, there was no effect. Um, vegetarian food has a very good effect. Kimchi, fermented foods have a good effect, good bacteria. 
So we can, you know, we are born with certain, within a month of birth, our gut, which is sterile at birth, gets populated by a thousand species of bacteria. And the way we enter this world, whether it is natural birth or C-section, influences the gut microbiome. Right. And kids born by C-section, and I don't want anyone listening to fret about this, if they have a, a parent who gave birth by C-section, but there's a slightly higher risk of certain autoimmune conditions, right. including celiac disease and asthma. So now there are two large-scale studies in our country, one in Virginia, one in New York, where mothers giving birth by C-section give permission, consent, enter the study, and then they're randomized, and half of them will get the newborn to be smeared with a piece of gauze, which wow. they have now taken from the birth canal onto the baby's newborn's face, body, and inside the mouth. What? And a year later, the studies show that their microbiome is more similar to the gut microbiome of children born by vaginal delivery. Wow, that is now we need to we need to study this for five years and sure. see. Aha, uh -huh, are they healthier? Are they have less ear infections, less asthma? They're not being diagnosed with celiac, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, lots of things. So time will tell, but it's a fascinating. I tell friends of mine who have kids who are about to deliver, talk to your obstetrician. Even if you're not in the study, they can do it for you. Many, not many, at least some obstetricians are actually offering it to their patients if they're going to undergo a C-section. I call it bacterial baptism. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, that's kind of like an inoculation to get the immune system jump started. And I'm so yeah. deep in this stuff right now, Sanjeev, and, and that blows my mind. I'm glad that there are people who are open to this. I'm glad there are um, academic doctors like you who are who are studying this and promoting this. And it's just fascinating. Yeah, you know, uh, Jordan, I think amongst the four hottest topics in medicine, biological sciences, one is the microbiome. I give a talk called Microbiome, Man and Medicine, often as a keynote in multiple CME courses in the country and you know Kuwait, Singapore, etc. I just gave it for a course in Singapore. We had to do it by Zoom. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that is a really hot topic. It has implications in autism. You know, there's a condition called C. diff colitis which one can get after being on an antibiotic. So this organism called Clostridia difficile or C. diff normally is dormant in our gut. Mm -hmm. And when we use an antibiotic and kill some of the other bacteria, this guy says, aha, it's my chance now. So it overgrows, produces a toxin, can lead to bloody diarrhea, severe colitis, really even death. And now we have to kill the C. diff. So paradoxically, we have to kill it with a different antibiotic. Right. And it works 70% of the time. 30% of the time, these people don't get better. You Jeez. know what makes it better? Stool transplant. Fecal microbiota transplant from a healthy donor. 90% cure rate. Wow. I've been hearing about these fecal transplants. It was one of the things that I've been meaning to ask you. And I know it's a very yeah. new it's and kind of It's one of the hottest topics. So again, linked to the gut microbiome, right? So there's a psychiatrist in Ireland. He's coined the term psychobiome. There's a study looking at 18 people with autism getting a healthy stool transplant. Marked improvement in neurological, psychological, and GI symptoms. And two years later, the microbiome remains reverted. There's a recent study presented just a few days ago that patients with alcoholic hepatitis, which when it's severe has a 50% mortality during that admission, given a fecal microbiota transplant improved and many lost their craving for alcohol. Three year follow up. Wow. So, and there's one study, it's only two patients. They were both from Poland and they had bad C. diff, this colitis we talked about, 
they were immunosuppressed and they had COVID-19. Wow. And they got a stool transplant and their C. diff and their COVID went. That is insane. Now, it's only two patients. Right, sure. But Sir William Osler, one of the greatest physicians known to mankind, once said, the best time to use a new drug is right away while it's still working. <laughs> <laughs> so it needs to be studied. But isn't that absolutely mind-boggling? If we have a cure for COVID and for bad conditions, health conditions, horrible diseases, by using a stool transplant. Now, in the future, we won't have to use a stool transplant. We'll be able to say, okay, which are the good bacteria? What do they do? What kind of gene expression do they change? We can simply give you bacteria. There's a private company for profit. I'm not going to mention the name. I'm on the advisory board. <laughs> so they will send a kit to your home. You take a sample of blood, finger stick, and you <clears throat> uh, supply them a specimen of saliva and stool. Put it in the mail. It's good for 30 days. Using artificial intelligence, they look at all the bacteria, they look at the gene expression, and then they claim that they will say to the person, you should take these two probiotics and these two supplements. Right. Make the good bacteria thrive and the bad bacteria shut up. So let's see what happens with that. Uh, there are many, many companies, including nonprofits at MIT, Open Biome, studying this microbiome. So I think microbiome, one of the hottest topics. The second hot topic is artificial intelligence. I don't call it artificial. I call it aided or augmented intelligence. And one can do a colonoscopy and incorporate AI. And AI will look at the polyp and say, this is benign. Leave it alone. Don't even biopsy it. Wow. Save $250 pathology fee. This one is pre-malignant. Get rid of it. Let's say mammogram. An experienced radiologist may have seen 10,000 mammograms. He sure. or she on Tuesday afternoon is tired and will make mistakes. AI can incorporate a million. CAT scan, MRI, skin lesions. So it's already percolating into the clinical arena right now, research. We did a study at the hospital I work at, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, one of my brilliant junior colleagues. Using AI, they picked up 30% more polyps compared to a seasoned, experienced gastroenterologist. Whoa. And could tell which one is benign, which one you should remove, which one you should not. So microbiome, AI, the third is something called CRISPR and gene editing. Oh, my God. I want to get your and, opinion on this. This, this, is, uh, a con this, is, this a, is a controversial one. No, 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 it isn't. It's a <laughs> okay. fascinating story. So, well, it's controversial. I'll... I'll come back to that. <laughs> but there's a wonderful book written by Walter Isaacson. He's a historian in, I think, Mississippi. His three previous books have been on Steve Jobs, Einstein, and Leonardo da Vinci. Wow. His most recent book, which is getting a huge amount of press, I pick up the book, I can't put it down. This guy is brilliant. And it's called Gene Editing, no, it's called Code Breaker, Jennifer Dudna, Gene Editing, and the Future of the Human Race. Wow. So Jennifer Dudna, when she was 10 or 12, comes back from school and finds on her pillow a small book, The Double Helix by James Watson. Uh, James Watson was 24 when together with Crick and Wilkinson, they published an article about the structure of life, DNA, double helix. And they got the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine a few years later. So she reads it. She is blown away. She goes next day to school, goes to a chemistry teacher and says, I want to learn chemistry. And this is our country. This chemistry teacher says to her, young lady, young lady, chemistry is for boys, not for girls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what happened last year? What's that? He got the Nobel Prize in chemistry. There you go. Teachers eating his words Together now. with. Together with Emmanuel Carpentier, a brilliant French researcher, first time two women have won a Nobel Prize together. She's going to be a billionaire. She's formed multiple companies. 
using gene editing, you can cure sickle cell anemia. These patients are getting blood transfusions. They're admitted to the hospital with bone crisis, liver crisis, lung crisis. It's only one or two patients right now, but gone. Wow. It has implications in cancer. It, CRISPR has implications in a rapid test for COVID-19. So anyway, microbiome, artificial aided intelligence, CRISPR and gene editing. And the fourth one, when I tell my physician colleagues this, I, I was telling a couple of residents in medicine at the Brigham I was teaching this morning, and I mentioned these four things. And I said, believe it or not, the fourth one is the psychedelic revolution. Oh, of course. So, we, right? we see this all the time now. Yeah. Ketamine coming back. I mean, look at severe refractory depression. Number one cause of death in 20 to 35-year-olds all over the world is death from suicide. We have horrible drugs. And if they don't respond, we give them transcranial magnetic stimulation of the brain, electroconvulsive therapy. They take ketamine, four or five treatments. They see life in a different light. There is neuroplasticity, new connections between neurons in the brain. Right. I know of a young man who was very depressed. He got ketamine, four or five treatments, totally changed his life. He says to his fiancee, I've hired the skating rink from four to six tomorrow morning. We have to go with my video camera and you're going to video me as I skate. So she does that. They send it to talent scouts. Guess what? Next thing he's playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> there you go, man. Quite a success story. So these, so Mass General, the chief of psychiatry, has left his position and assumed the position of chief of the Psychedelic Institute. Mass General Hospital, number one <laughs> hospital in the world, Harvard Medical School. Harvard Law School has opened a center to study psychedelics and the law. So these are four amazing you know, things that are happening. And of course, coffee is linked to the microbiome and to happiness and so many of these things. Mm -hmm. um, even, you know, focusing and alertness. I mean, and it is a psychoactive. It's the best psychoactive. Let's be honest. It's the best psychoactive that you yeah. can take every day with the disease prevention that it provides you. It, it, there's, yeah. there's really no second um, to it. So fascinating that you shared all that with us, Sanjeev. Yeah. We're going to let you go Terrific. for just a minute. Um, I would have one more question before you go. You wrote, sure. this, you wrote this book again, uh, Sanjeev's new book, Coffee, the Magical Elixir. Um, you cite so many studies. Like you said, I'm, uh, I'm subscribed to the Google News of coffee. I get all the good studies pouring in. Occasionally, you see ones that show negative effects of coffee. When you look at a study, positive or negative, what do you look at to, you mentioned dose dependence. What do you look at to see if it's a, a good study, have, a reliable study? See, yeah, yeah, you have to see, is it dose dependent? Is there more than one study? Or where was the study published? Because the best journals, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, Annals of Internal Medicine, have a very, very strict editorial board ah. with 30 senior professors. And they meet every week and they get these manuscripts and they say, okay, this one on coffee and mortality. Uh, Dr. Lamont, why don't you look at it? Dr. Smith, Jennifer Smith, why don't you look at it? Next week, give us your preliminary take on it. Should reject it outright, except, except with revisions, except with more data. So the coffee study and mortality published by Friedman, he was the first author, I was talking to Dr. Lamont, who's my colleague at the BI, professor of medicine, gastroenterologist. He's on the editorial board of New England Journal of Medicine. He said, you know, we got this study and we're saying, are we going to publish a study on coffee in a <laughs> medical journal? And then they said, well, we looked at the evidence and the statistics and the methodology, couldn't argue with it. And we said, you know what? We have to publish it. And they published it. And now, of course, there are multiple studies. So you look at where's the study published? You know, how many patients did they study? Did they control for all the other confounding factors, um, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera? And then if it gets published again, published again in a different journal with a different subset of people, right. different ethnic groups, European patients, um, longer follow up, then it adds validity. So the Great negative answer. studies are very, very few. 
And you know, yeah, if you have irritable bowel syndrome and bad diarrhea, coffee may make it worse. If you have gastroesophageal reflux disease, heartburn, coffee and decaf coffee can make it worse. If you have a tremor, it may make it worse. Um, if you are unable to drink coffee, I'm one of those people after 4 p.m. <laughs> but then I've had four cups. But uh, if I drink after 4 p.m., I'll be up all night. I'll be up till <laughs> three in the morning. Right. So not for every single person, but make it work for you and, and get on that de- disease prevention train yeah. with coffee. Again, one more yeah. time, coffee, the magical elixir. Sanjeev, I'm going to give you a compliment no one else has ever given you, I'm sure. Um, there's this term OG. It stands for original gangster. And what I mean by that is you are this luminary. You're an OG. You're this luminary who knows everybody in the field. <laughs> and and But you're also into this cutting edge stuff like the psychedelics and the, the microbiome study. Like yeah. you are seriously, you're a legend. You're an OG. Oh, and, thank and, you so and, much. and I appreciate thank you your so time. Much. Seriously. So in the Sanjeev. coffee book, in the coffee book, uh, all the research is there with references and the different kinds of coffee, the quotes about coffee, the legend of coffee. There's a nice index. It's it's a very simple book. And again, a bunch of my amazing colleagues and world-renowned professors have endorsed it. And one of them said, if you drink coffee, you must read the book. If you don't drink coffee, you must read the book. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I know my audience is going to absolutely love it. One more time. You're a legend, man. Take care. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Sanjeev. Be well. Enjoy. We'll let you go. Bye-bye. The island. Bye. <laughs> Take care. All right, everybody. That was Sanjeev. Can you believe it? Every time he comes on, he blows my mind. Um, I did not know that interview was going to take that turn. I know you guys loved it. Uh, I can't wait to do more content with that guy. My God. Again, uh, apologies for the audio quality of the. I mean, it was still good, but you know, I'm not in my studio with my nice condenser microphones and, and things like that. I'll be right back there next week. Um, should be back to the regular schedule and all that stuff. And we will see you next time on the Coffee Health and Science Podcast. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.